just so in love with Peter. You know, I I actually owe Peter everything. I do. So, um, my last relationship was with Joel in 2016. And I mean, like, I've had flings here and there. But my last boyfriend was Joel, 2016. And I broke up with you. 
because I found out that you cheated on me. I don't know who the fuck would have wanted you back then though. Because you're like 50 kilos overweight. And you have a small dick. So it's not like you're anything special. Anyway, so <laughs> then I fell in love with Peter and he taught me like he's the one that opened me up again to love. So I do owe him a lot. It feels good. It feels good. Now, oh, <laughs> I just had a conversation over the phone with a pedophile called Sam that works in mental health. So my skin is still crawling. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> hi, hope everyone is well. Hope everyone had a lovely weekend. I don't work on weekends. I'm not online on weekends. <laughs> Um, whew. it's Tuesday now. I've been slack. Excuse me. Inbred Mary just put out a video that came up on my homepage. Fugitive RN, I think right now stands for right now. Fugitive right now, Pisces on run from different states are about to be caught soon. AL, oh, so AL, FL, TL, TN, one masculine, one feminine. Go away. I'm working. Oh, and I also live right across the road from the most amazing Italian restaurant. So I had a big dinner, so I'm really, really, really lethargic. <laughs> I ate so much that I can't breathe. <sighs> so I think I'm going to cut back on eating and get back, you know, into the gym <laughs> more because on Saturday night there was just nagging this and because there was so many so many voices so many people talking at me like at once <coughs> I did my cards and I kept on getting the two of pentacles which means I supposed to balance out your life <laughs> And so I was like, oh. So then I had a dream that night that I lived in Italy. And I was in a restaurant and I was so fat. I had food all over my face. And I couldn't breathe properly because I was so fat. And when I was walking, I was walking like. I had a vibrator up my ass because I was so fat. So I think that's what they want me to do. I think they want me to like eat less, <laughs> exercise more, be more balanced. So that's what I have to do now. So yeah. So I um I've actually needed an excuse to talk about this. Um I saw an 
<laughs> on Instagram. I'm really laughing because I'm giggly because I'm drinking champagne. Um, I sort of... <laughs> Dickhead before. <laughs> anyway, um, drunk um by the way drinking is bad so don't drink until you're an adult mm -hmm. um <laughs> like i said i was on instagram i mean as i was saying i saw an instagram that october is domestic violence awareness month so i've been i've been needing to talk about this for ages so i'm going to talk about it about domestic violence well you know how i feel about all violence in general i do not accept it i do not condone it at all so um yes it can be it can be completely stopped so what we just need to do is just find ways to prevent it from happening ever again so um i just looked up for i just looked up I searched for um, testimonies from domestic violence survivors and I came across this one, Tara Costigan, The Life and Death of a Victim of Domestic Violence. It's well documented, but one shocking case has left a family bereft and still searching for answers. Tara Costigan, a mother of three, was killed in an axe attack just a week after giving birth to her daughter. Her former partner, Marcus Rappel, pleaded guilty to the murder. Tonight, the victim's family has spoken exclusively to 7.30 about her life and her death. And a warning, this report from Madeline Morris contains graphic descriptions of violence. She just loved family and everybody loved her. And she was sort of always, always there in the middle of everything. <laughs> Tara Costigan didn't have the easiest start in life. I had Tara from three weeks old and I looked after her on and off for long periods um, until she was about uh, seven and a half when her dad died. That's her dad um, and that's me looking much younger. Tara's father took his own life 
Her mum had many children to different dads and often found it hard to cope. This chaotic home life frequently saw Tara staying with her grandparents, Margaret and Jim, and hanging out with her cousin Nathan. I had an infectious laugh um, from as a child to an adult. She, you knew something was going on if you could hear her laughing because it was pretty loud and, and pretty Tara, I guess. The loving extended family provided much needed stability, even when Tara became pregnant with her first son, Riley, at the age of 16. A second son, Drew, followed two years later. Despite her young age, Tara was a loving, dedicated mother. Her focus was her children. Her children were not going to be brought up the way she was brought up. Her children were going to have all the opportunities. Three years ago, when Tara brought over a new boyfriend, Marcus Rappel, the family welcomed him, even though they had some reservations. He was oddly quiet, but didn't scare me quite, so he was polite. He seemed okay, but there was just something about him that just didn't gel with me. Tara was thrilled when she became pregnant again. To help with the kids, her sister Ricky Schmidt moved in. Ricky soon saw all wasn't well between Tara and Marcus. It was just off and on fights. One fight he was cracking his knuckles and he said the, along the lines of if you don't stop talking, that'll be the last thing you do. I could see was, you know, I've lived a long time. It was leading towards a type of verbal domestic violence. She wasn't messaging me, she wasn't ringing me, she wasn't coming to see me, um, and she was sort of cutting herself off. As Tara's pregnancy progressed, Marcus became more threatening, but she still wanted the relationship to work. She asked her uncle, Michael Costigan, to speak to Marcus. He told me that he, he had his own anger issues. He told me that in, in that conversation. And, uh, and um, he actually said to me, I know it's a problem. Um, and he even talked about you know, how he felt about women. And what did he think about women? Let's just say he doesn't, he, he didn't have a lot of respect for women. He didn't trust women. The intervention didn't work, and just weeks before she gave birth, Tara kicked Marcus out. But the verbal harassment continued. Finally, six days after their daughter Ayla was born, Tara took out a domestic violence order against Marcus. Because of previous threats that she's gotten from Marcus, she wanted to keep her kids safe and herself. She only did it because she thought it was right. Instead of protecting her, it caused him to snap. Yesterday in court, a former partner revealed that Rappel, who had a history of threatening women, had vowed to kill the next woman who took out a DVO against him. True to his word, the day he received Tara's DVO, he bought an axe and drove to her house. CCTV footage shows him driving back and forth in front of her place for three quarters of an hour. Finally, after her brother leaves, Marcus Rappel makes his entrance. It was probably about, I don't know, 3, 3.40 and then I heard a smash of a window or something and I thought it was, might have been the boys kicking a ball and put it through the window and they would get in trouble for it. But uh, once I walked out, it wasn't until I seen the boys running towards me, screaming. I looked at the door and I noticed that and then Tara came in from her bedroom. And then I seen Marcus behind her. He was just screaming. An axe in his hand, Marcus was chasing Tara, who was cradling her baby in her arms. Instinctively, Ricky Schmidt reached out to protect her sister. He tried, to grab, tried her. to grab her to move her close to me and to get into the laundry, um, into my bedroom. But as I put my hands on Tara, that's when he swung and hit us, hit at, like, swung and hit us both. Um, and from there, Tara fell to the ground. Marcus Rappel had sliced into the back of Tara's neck. He hit Ricky's little finger, severing a tendon. At that point, I grabbed my phone and called triple zero. And I told them what was going on. Can you please explain to me how it happened? You had my sister's ex-boyfriend coming! 
Rappel hit Tara Costigan was the day he killed her. Yesterday in Canberra, Marcus Rappel pleaded guilty to the grievous bodily harm of Ricky Schmidt. He had previously pleaded guilty to murdering Tara Costigan. He'll be sentenced in August. I hope what comes out of this is a renewed uh, commitment from, from everyone, including yourselves, the media and everyone, to be really upfront and honest and, and determined not to just accept and deal with it but to look towards ways in which this can be changed. The greatest impact of this tragic murder will be felt by Tara Costigan's three children who will now grow up without their mother. But there is hope rising from tragedy. Her family has set up a foundation to fund social workers for domestic violence victims and convened a national family violence summit earlier this year. What we need is awareness, we need education and we need lobbying. You know, so the, the, the Tara Costigan Foundation will be very much about that. Tara's two sons are now living with their father, her daughter Ayla, is with Tara's aunt. Hello. Ricky Schmidt lives every day with the memory of the death of her sister, which she hopes will ultimately not have been in vain. And what do you think Tara would want her legacy to be? To stop domestic violence. She wouldn't want this for anybody. She wouldn't want it for her daughter or her kids. Madeline Morris reporting, and if that story has raised concerns for you, there is help available. You can call the National Family Violence Counselling Service on 1800 737 732. Oof, how sad is that? That's a, um, an extreme case. And what that man said is that what we do need is lobbying and awareness. Mm-hmm. So what I have spoken about plenty of times is the importance of loving yourself first um, because you need to love yourself enough to know when to, when to walk away from certain things, certain places, and, of course, certain people. Even if you do love them, if they are bad for you, you have to walk away. So I said at the beginning of this um, that the last relationship I was in was 2016 with Joel. But I dumped him because I found out he cheated on me. And even though I was so in love with him, I dumped him. And... That really did that really did break my heart as well. And after I dumped him, I was still wanting to talk to him and um so it was it was hard to let him go. It was hard to get him out of my system. Now <laughs> I see a lot of videos on YouTube um where YouTube is saying that exes from my past want to come back. <laughs> Please don't. I don't really want to know any of you. I mean, like, we break up.
for a reason. We don't need to reconnect. Because I don't want any of you back. So. Don't come near me ever again. What is really hot at the moment is... Um... I'm going to be sick. Oh, I'm going to be sick. Oh, God. Because I've got such a crush on Evan Peters, I wouldn't have watched this if, like, if he wasn't in it, if it was someone else, <laughs> I wouldn't have watched it. But it's called Dama or Dama? Dama. D it's D A H M E R. So it's either pronounced Dama or Dama. And it's about that serial killer from ages ago that was really, 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 really sick. Now, I've made videos. And I've talked about this because I want to know what, what makes people really fucked up. Now, they went really they went really deep with this. So they're actually looking like they were using him as a case study for one. And I guess the, the whole point of the series was to help us kind of figure out why people are so messed up, like why they actually become, you know, evil. Like if they are born evil or if something happened to them in their life that made them become evil. So I don't actually think that this person, this Jeffrey Dahmer, Dahmer guy, I don't think that he was born evil. I think it's because he was, he's dead now, thank goodness. I know uh, it's bad to speak ill of, the, ill of the dead, but he was psycho. He was, he, he didn't need to be here. So that's okay, it doesn't matter for him. Um, he was a victim of domestic violence. He um, witnessed his parents arguing a lot and also his dad was teaching him how to like gut things. Like they went fishing and his dad taught him how to gut a fish after they've caught it and he was teaching Jeffrey um, like you know all, the, all this taxidermy stuff like you know removing dead animals insides and then stuffing them and preserving them. Um, what I actually do find interesting about Jeffrey Dama Dama? I don't care. Um I mean like I don't care like how you pronounce his last name. I don't care if I get it wrong. Uh, <laughs> is that he actually wanted to know what was wrong with him. He was actually interested to find out what was wrong with him, like if he was born evil or if he just became evil. Yeah. I desensitize myself to it. I, 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 uh, 
I don't know. I went to great lengths. He is pure evil, but you'd never know it by looking at him. But when you hear him, that's another story. His killing field was Milwaukee, and he got away with murder for more than a decade. But how could any of this happen? For the first time ever, Nancy Glass is here inside the world of Jeffrey Dahmer. Bill, when I sat down opposite Jeffrey Dahmer for this interview, I wondered what he would tell me, how hard it would be to get him to discuss his horrific crimes. What I found was that he was very forthcoming. He volunteered details that may be difficult to hear. I began by asking what he wanted from the men he picked up. I had uh, these obsessive uh, desires and, and uh, thoughts wanting to control them, to, uh, I don't know how to put it, uh, possess them permanently. And that's why you killed them? Right. Right. Not because I was angry with them, not because I hated them, but because I wanted to keep them with me. And uh, as my obsession grew, uh, he was saving body parts such as uh, skulls and uh, skeletons. Jeffrey Dahmer is recalling his monstrous past. Almost two years ago in this little apartment in Milwaukee, police discovered the grisly remnants of one of the most horrible crime sprees in American history. Jeffrey Dahmer, an unassuming chocolate factory worker, would eventually confess that he had seduced, murdered, and dismembered 17 young men. He even ate some of his victims' body parts. He instantly became the center of worldwide media attention, a serial killer unmasked. There were protests and press conferences in Milwaukee as people tried to understand how this could have happened in their midst. How did Jeffrey Dahmer get away with murder after murder for 13 years? How did a boy born into a hard-working, middle-class family turn into the worst kind of monster imaginable? In this exclusive interview, we put those questions to Jeffrey Dahmer himself. We met with him at the maximum security prison where he is serving his sentence of 999 years. For the first time, he talks about his crimes and gives us a chilling look inside the mind of a serial killer. It's a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Uh, when you uh, depersonalize another person and view them as just an object, uh, an object for pleasure instead of a, a living, breathing human being, uh, it... it seems to make it easier to uh, do things you shouldn't do. The reason why Jeffrey Dahmer was able to get away with his crimes was because of just what you are seeing here. Jeffrey Dahmer is intelligent and articulate. That is what makes him so frightening. But if you listen carefully to his words throughout this interview, you realize it is a thin disguise. You do sound, though, like the kind of person who could have said to himself... This is wrong. I must stop. I always knew that, that it was wrong, but uh, uh, after the, the first, the first uh, killing was not planned. I was uh, coming back from the shopping mall back in 78. I had had uh, fantasies about picking up a, a hitchhiker and... Uh, taking him back to the house and uh, having complete control and dominance over him. The hitchhiker's name was Stephen Hicks. He was just 18. Jeffrey Dahmer took him to his parents' house. There he strangled him with a barbell. He dismembered the body and hid it in a drain pipe. It was Jeffrey Dahmer who gave those details to the police in his confession. No one, no one had a clue as to what was happening for, for over a decade. During that time, Jeffrey Dahmer joined the army and was sent to Germany. He was eventually discharged for a drinking problem and returned to Ohio. Nine years after Stephen Hicks' murder, the killing began again. What happened to you in the nine years in between that you were able to stop, that you were able to control yourself? It just wasn't an opportunity to uh, fully express what I wanted to do to do. There was just not the, the physical opportunity to do it then. And uh, I started 
when I moved to Milwaukee in 81, uh, I started reading pornography, going to the bookstores. Um, eventually that led to uh, frequenting the gay bars. And then I, one time I brought this uh, young man back to the hotel room, the Ambassador Hotel. I uh, was just planning on drugging him and uh, spending the night with him. I had no intention of hurting him. When I woke up in the morning, he uh, had a broken rib here. I was heavily bruised. Apparently, I had uh, beaten him to death with my fists. And you have no memory? I have no memory of it. But that's what started the whole spree all over again. Dahmer says he snuck the corpse of his victim, Stephen Toomey, out of his hotel room in a suitcase. Then he took it to his grandmother's house, where he cut up the body and put it in plastic garbage bags. When you killed these men, afterwards, were you repulsed? Were you upset? No, it, at the time, uh, it, was, it was almost addictive. It was almost... Uh, a surge of energy. Uh, I wouldn't have to uh, uh, worry about um, any of their needs or anything. I just had complete control of the situation. But Jeffrey Dahmer was out of control. The urge to kill had overpowered him. As police later learned, he wasn't satisfied with his victim's death. He wanted more. Why did you photograph them? It was my way of remembering uh, their appearance, their physical beauty. Uh, I also wanted to keep something. If I couldn't keep them there with me whole, I, at least I felt that I could keep uh, their skeletons. And uh, I even went so far as planning on uh, setting up an altar with uh, the uh, Ten different uh, skulls and skeletons. And what was the purpose of the altar going to be? Uh, as a sort of uh, memorial, uh, a, a point where I could—I don't know—it's it's, it's so bizarre and strange. It's hard to describe. A place where I could collect my thoughts uh, and feed my obsession. When the bodies were still in your apartment. There was no time when you would see them and say, this is grotesque, what have I done? There were times, there were times, but the compulsive obsession with uh, doing what I was doing overpowered any feelings of revulsion. This man, with a quiet, almost shy demeanor, became a master manipulator who was able to lure strangers he met at gay bars to his apartment. He was even able to con the police into returning a 14-year-old boy to him after neighbors called 911 upset that the child was in the street naked and bleeding. Dahmer convinced the police that he and the boy were simply having a lover's quarrel. The intoxicated uh, boyfriend of another boyfriend. After the police left, Jeffrey Dahmer murdered that boy, Conorak sent the some phone. This man says he had a near-fatal encounter with Jeffrey Dahmer. You want to take some picture of my back? He hit me with a rubber hammer on my neck. He was lucky to escape because by then the killing had become almost routine. Before you went out to pick up a man, was there any kind of ritual you went through? I go to the nightclubs, uh, drink, watch the, uh, the strip tea shows. And uh, if I didn't meet anyone at the bars, I'd uh, go to the bath clubs and uh, meet, meet someone there, offer them money, and we'd go back to the apartment, uh, have a few drinks. I'd have the, uh, the uh, sleeping pill mixture already prepared. Person would drink it, fall asleep, and uh, that's when they would be strangled. Watching the movie Exorcist 3 was also part of his ritual. It put him in the mood for murder. I felt so hopelessly uh, evil and perverted that uh, 
that I, I actually derives a sort of pleasure from watching that tape. Did you like feeling evil? No. No, I didn't. But uh, I tried to overcome the thoughts, and it worked for a while, but eventually I gave in. While Jeffrey Dahmer may say things today that make it seem like he understands what went on in his mind, he does not. All he can do is tell you what happened, but he cannot stop whatever it is that drove him to kill in the first place. Do you still feel those same urges? Do you still feel that compulsion, that obsession? Uh, I wish I could say that uh, it just left completely, but uh, no, there are times when I still do still do have uh, the old compulsions. Jeffrey Dahmer says as time went on, his mind became more and more warped, and yet he was clever enough to continue to elude police and lure young men to his apartment. We should warn you, the details are very graphic. I started having these obsessive thoughts uh, when I was about uh, 15 and 16, and they got worse and worse. What were your fantasies about? Uh... They were sexual fantasies of control, power, uh, complete dominance. Uh, they became reality. Was there pleasure in that fantasy? There was excitement, uh, fear, pleasure all mixed together. Jeffrey Dahmer fulfilled his fantasies by murdering and dismembering 17 young men. In time, his desires became more extreme, his deeds more grotesque. Listen to him talk about the most unnatural things in the most matter-of-fact of ways. That's when you realize that none of it has touched him. I was uh, branching out. That's when the cannibalism started, eating of the heart and uh, the arm muscle. It was a way of uh, making me feel that uh, they were a part of me. At, at, for, at first it was just curiosity, and then it became compulsive. Then I tried to uh, keep the person alive by inducing a zombie-like state. Um, by uh, injecting... Uh, first uh, dilute acid solution into their brain or uh, hot water and uh, it never did completely work could someone like you be stopped could you be helped no i i was i was dead set on on going with this compulsion it was the only thing that gave me any uh any satisfaction he became so warped by his evil impulses that he even took a victim's head with him to work at the Ambrosia Chocolate Factory. I kept the, uh, the mummified uh, head and skull of one of the victims in uh, a, a carrying case in my locker at work. Were you almost flaunting it? Yes, but that's how strong the compulsion was. That's how bizarre the, the desire was. I wanted to keep something of, of the person with me. Jeffrey Dahmer exhibited some disturbing behavior early on. He began drinking heavily as a teenager, dropped out of college, was arrested for indecent exposure, disorderly conduct, and fondling a 13-year-old boy. Tragically, one of his murder victims would be that boy's brother. Do you know what started it? Was there any kind of incident that you can remember? To this day, I don't know what started it. And, uh, the person to blame is sitting right across from you. That's the only person. Not uh, parents, not society, not pornography. I mean, those are just excuses. His macabre 13-year crime spree finally ended when this man, Tracy Edwards, brought the police to the infamous apartment. Like the others, he had gone there with the promise of money. He was listening to my heart, because at a point he told me he was going to eat my heart at that point. I hit him, I, and I ran. What was the turning point for you that made you suddenly realize that you had done something terribly wrong, something you should be sorry for? It was uh, the night of the arrest. I have no memory of what happened uh, during the six hours before uh, the last victim ran out of the apartment. I heard a knock on the door. And the police were there uh, with with the last victim. Uh, they asked me where the key was to the handcuffs. I was 
my mind was in a haze, I sort of pointed to the bedroom, and that's where they uh, found the pictures. And they, they yelled, cuff them. And I was uh, handcuffed. And uh, it, it was just the realization that there was no point in trying to hide, hide uh, my actions anymore. The, the best route was to help, help the police identify all the victims and just uh, make a complete confession. When it was revealed that most of the victims were black or homosexual, people in Milwaukee were incensed. Many felt that was why he went after them and why the police didn't seem to care when their families reported them missing. Ten of your 17 victims were black. Were they racially motivated? It, it was not racially motivated. It was not a sexual preference. It was just to find an obsession with uh, the best-looking young man I could find. While you just heard him say that his sexual preference had nothing to do with the killings, no. he has not come no. to terms with no. his homosexuality. Never understood it. There was no use trying to fight it because I, I couldn't rid myself of it. It was... It was too powerful and persistent. Do you dislike it? Yes, it's caused uh, a lot of problems for me. A lot of conflicts and uh, unanswered questions. The conflicts remain with him, and so do his compulsions. But in prison, he finally cannot act on his savage desires. If you were out on the street now, would you still be committing the crimes? Probably. If this hadn't happened, there's no doubt I probably would be. I can't think of anything that would have stopped me. Oh. I know there are going to be some people out there that might want to crucify me for saying this. But I actually feel sorry for him. I do. Because... <sighs> When he was talking, he was very, very sheepish. When he, like, as he was talking, and he takes full responsibility. He took full responsibility, but in like very, very sheepish way. So, like he said, he is. He knew that what he was doing was wrong. But he's interested to know why he became like that. He didn't say that in so many words, but he was leaving, like, hints here and there. But it's very interesting that he mentioned his parents because his parents were blaming each other. Like, you know, you did this and because of all the pills that you took when you were pregnant with him and then the mother was blaming the father because of the taxidermy shit. Now, chill, well... Actually, children shouldn't be watching this because I don't really have a filter. Children should not be watching me, like I said. Um, so, teachers, 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 teachers. Um, you are your students' duty of care. So you, need to, you have to educate your children as well. Now, if there are ch kitties that are that are watching me it is not normal and it is not okay if you see mum and dad fighting yelling at each other hitting each other and it is not okay and not normal for mum and dad or like mum or dad or both to be yelling at you and to be hitting you yeah, there's a difference between discipline, being disciplined, and being beat. So, kids get smacked. That's just part of learning. It's discipline. Um, but getting beat is not okay, not normal. So, I will tell you something. When I was... Um, quite young I had a few stepdads and the one that I had which was the worst of them all his name was Scott now 
I saw him looking in on my sister when she was having a shower. And then I caught him again looking at me through the window when I was getting when I was getting dressed. Anyway, so um and he was also like very very abusive. So he would pick fights on purpose. And so I um picked up, picked up the phone to call the police and he ripped the phone line out of the wall and he broke the phone so I couldn't call the police. Then I said to him, okay, well, I'm just going to tell my teacher when I get to when Yeah, and then he said, okay. So, so he actually scared me out of it. He said, okay, so if you go and tell your teachers, they're going to call the police. And what might happen is you're going to put you're going to be put into foster care so people might take you and your sister but they might not take your brother with you so you're going to be separated from your brother and your sister um so i didn't say anything i didn't do anything um so this scott is probably watching right now because you're a fucking freak you traumatized me. You traumatized the fuck out of me. When I was seven, eight or nine. When you told my mum that you were a, a Wiccan. That you practiced Wicca. And you made a potion. That you gave my mum. That put her in a fucking coma. You're a sick, sick, sick fucking cunt. So that traumatized me from when I was seven, eight or nine. And then, um, I don't know why my mom still stayed with him after that. And this is like bottom of the barrel. Scott is bottom of the fucking barrel. Anyway, I, um, not last week or the week before. Oh, there are sirens going off. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, my mum bought me this diamond ring, so pretty, um, and we were just bitching about Scott, and she said, I am so sorry, I am just so sorry, if I live my life all over again, I would have just been on a single parent pension and I just would have stayed home with you kids so yeah um, then I caught Scott cheating on my mum and my brother had already hit puberty I was 19 and my sister was 20 so we like had already developed into adults young adults and so he went he cheated on my mum with someone that had two little boys so the reason why he went with a woman that has two little boys is because um he likes, um, uh. I guess, perving and diddling little kids. 
he asked me to show him my pubic hair when I started growing pubic hair and I said no and after that he was just always 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 picking fights and shit um so <laughs> Um, thank God he didn't actually sexually abuse or assault any of um, my sister, any of me, like me or my siblings. Um, so you have a right to feel safe. You have a right. You have a right to be safe and you have a right to feel safe. Now, <laughs> if your parents are hitting you, if they're abusing you, please do speak up about it. That's what your teachers are there for. That's what the police are there for. Okay? There are couples out there that cannot that are reproductively challenged, meaning that they, they can't have kids of their own. So they adopt and a lot of them do courses so they can foster children, okay? So there is always, there is always, always, always someone that cares. So, um, when I was in grade six, I was um, friends with a girl that I'm not going to mention. I'm not going to mention her name. Um, but she always had burn. She always had burns on her legs. She always had scabs on her legs, and she always had a bruise on her body. Always, like there was always something new on her body. And she always would want to come over to my house for a sleepover almost every weekend. And most weekends she wanted to go shopping. And we were in like grade six. And she always wanted to do something with me. And then one day she asked me to go to her house for a sleepover. And so I did. And I was so uncomfortable being there. She had two older brothers and an older sister and a younger sister. So their family was really, like, really full. And when her mum went to sleep, her two brothers came out and they were teenagers and they smoked a lot. They were drinking. And so she asked them if we can borrow... Um, their VCR player, because back then it was VC, like, you know, VCRs. And her brother said, God, you're a fucking bitch. And that was the first time I ever heard a swear word, like someone calls someone that, like, in person, like, IRL, in real life. And she was like, no, I'm not. And they were throwing shit at her. They, like, I didn't see anyone hit her or, or, or burn her. Um, but I only heard them call her a bitch that one time. And now I'm just like, oh, now I know why she always wants to come over to my house. And it was her two older brothers that smoked cigarettes. Her mum didn't smoke, her little sister didn't smoke, and her older sister didn't smoke. So it was both of her brothers that were burning her with cigarettes. It was fucked up so I want to get off here tonight you know what I can't even breathe properly because I ate so much Whew. and I have th like I've got two no I got three cannolis one was chocolate one was caramel one was vanilla and I still have two cannolis left in the fridge but I don't want to think about food anymore. Anyway, I want to get off here tonight knowing that there are going to be police going in into schools and talking to children about domestic violence 
and, you know, just letting them know what they've seen in their time and all the services that are available um, if children need to be removed from their parents. Because some people do need to be removed from their parents. There are a lot of fucked up, fucked, fucked up parents out there that have kids that shouldn't have kids. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about it? Um, because I know that your parents can fuck you up. Like, I told my mum the other day, I said to her the other day, the day that she won't like that she get, well, I think she gave me this room because she feels really bad. I was talking to her about, um, my drug addiction, like how I overcame it and stuff. And I told her like that... I was traumatized when that stepdad, Scott, said that he was a Wiccan and practiced Wicca and gave my mom a potion that he made, which put her in a coma. And what he did is like, he caught a mouse, like a random like feral mouse, and he killed it and he opened its body. And he put, like, its liver in this potion. <sighs> oh, yeah. I'm pretty sick, like, thinking about it. Um, yeah, and then, um, and then my mom got me this, this ring. <laughs> and it cost a lot. And then she said, I'm so sorry. I had no idea. And then she said, yeah. If um, I could live my life again, I would have gone on a single parent pension and just stayed at home with you kids instead of leaving us with fuckheads and then going off to work. And <laughs> then I spoke about it for the first time in my entire life last year. I think it was around this time last year. And it was the best thing that I've ever done because it was like this huge like cloud that just got like it felt like the whole world had been lifted off my shoulders so I went through all of that I went through through drug through drug addiction and you know all these other things just like you know numb the pain when all I could have done <laughs> when I was seven, eight or nine was just have told someone about it. So please do, please do take advantages of the services that are available to you. So, um, As I said, <laughs> um, before I got on here, I was talking to a pedophile called Sam that works in mental health. Now, according to these police statements, this little bitch, Ivy, was born in 2014. Austin was born, so that makes her, so last year she would have been seven, turning eight this year. Austin was born in 2012. And Riley was born in 2003, so 19, eight and 10. Now, um, so Austin, Ivy, and Riley, um, I wholeheartedly 
believe. Well, I think you are incredibly fucked up now. And I think you always will be fucked up. Because you lied to so many people. You broke their hearts when you lied to them. You broke your hearts again when the truth came out. I think that's unforgivable. I don't think anyone will be able to forgive you for that. Now, You are fucked up because your parents do not love you. Your parents do not care about you. What the fuck kind of parent would let their own child be filmed and photographed in the most disgusting, disgusting way. Now, you're, you all already have bright orange hair. Look, there's a two of pentacles again. This is for me. This isn't for anyone else. I'm getting messages. <clears throat> now, I actually do think, I do think that Riley... Austin and Ivy. Um, I think they should be on a government watch list. Because, you know, it's going to sink in with them at some point that, fuck, what my parents did allow for me to happen is was wrong Um, all right, so Ivy was a fucking ugly baby. You were a fucking ugly toddler, and you're fucking ugly now, and you have, like, red hair, like, bright orange hair. I think that you are, 
I think that it, I think it is going to be an absolute lunatic when it becomes an adult. I think the same with um, Austin and I think the same about Riley now. Well, Riley's 19 and for him to like, you know, the, the shit that he lies about, you're beyond help. And it's because of your upbringing. It's because of how, because of what your parents exposed you to. Yeah. Now, um, Riley, this is so funny. I had a look at your Instagram pictures and you are a fucking zit farm. You have bad acne all over your face. Now, <laughs> I don't think my brother's going to mind if I tell this story, but I used to use this vagina soap called Femfresh and <laughs> um, I didn't want anyone in my family to know that I was, you know, that I was washing myself with vagina soap. And so I peeled the label, <laughs> I peeled the label off it and I just left it in the shower. <laughs> and my brother had really 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 bad acne bad back then from you know hormones and shit and um he was using that pro proactive which has like benzyl peroxide in it so when you stop using proactive like it dries out your face but then when you st when you stop using it you just break out again so he was actually using my vagina, my vagina soap, my Femme Fresh, and um, it ran out one day. And he said, "Oh, Jess, what what's um that orange stuff called?" And I said, "My vagina soap." <laughs> and he goes, "Is that your vagina soap?" And I said, "Yeah." He said, "I've been using that on my face for ages." And it cleared up all my acne. So there you go. Vagina soap is actually good for acne. Because it's pH balanced. Yeah. It was so funny. Couldn't stop laughing. Um, so yeah. Um, it's not like I was like putting the bottle like on my vagina. I was just like putting it in my hand. And then washing myself with it. But then my gynecologist said to stop using vagina soap because it was really dry and irritated because like it disrupted the pH balance or something. So there you go. You fucking ugly zit farm. If you want to get rid of that fucking disgusting acne, go buy a fucking bottle of Femfresh. Fucking freak. You fucking dirty, disgusting, fucking rapist. You fucking orange zit farm. Inbred fucking rapist. Now, like I said, you are fucked up. Because of your fucked up upbringing. So. Get some fucking help immediately. Now, it's not my business that you that you were involved in the rape 
of your little sister and your brother. Not my fucking business whatsoever. But when you put my name into your fuckery, then it becomes my business. You fucking ugly dumb cunt. So, that is how that, like, this is extreme cases of domestic violence. Can you see how it fucks people up? Hmm. But what about comics that actually haven't been subjected to domestic violence in their childhood? Like, what's their excuse? That's not what, that's not what, what we, <laughs> that's not what we're talking about though. <coughs> oh yeah. I took screenshots of something. So, 16th of April, um, see how there's James? Now, this happened in his group chat, you know, in, the, in his live chat conversations. I heard people, look, people were saying, I have intercourse with kids. I have intercourse with kids. I have intercourse with kids, rape children while they bleed and cry for their mummy, rape and molest little kids and cut their genitals and cut their genitals off. So then, um. Then I commented on something a few weeks ago where I said that someone tried to, um, someone made fake reports about me to the police to get me set up for, like, you know, child rape accusations. And then someone said, that did not happen to you. And they wanted me to upload the police statements. And I was like, what? And then I was talking to this guy before called Sam and I recorded it on my computer. And he was saying that, um, that he was trying to make it look like I was crazy, <clears throat> that I was having an episode of psychosis, and I seem to believe that these things are happening around me. Well, I definitely didn't make it up in my head <laughs> because I don't think about Austin, I don't think about Riley, I don't think about Ivy, I don't think about Rachel, I don't think about Nathan or any of those fuckheads that I fucked off years ago. So, um, but apparently... 
the authorities. Well, th this is what it looks like to me. It looks like you're trying to sweep it under the rug to everyone that was involved in, in that. So the police aren't going to do anything about that. They're just going to let children be violated by their own families and filmed and shit. It's fucked. <sighs> anyway, so um, the other day, I love music. I love music, I love music, I love music. I was listening to the Rasmus. I love the Rasmus. And there's a song called Shot. And the singer is like, I'll take this shot for you. We'll listen to it, we'll listen to it. If I get sued for playing it, so be it. No copyright infringement intended. Pixel 7 Pro at Telstra and get more than you think for less than you expect. Enjoy $427 of bonus value with a good...
Okay, so... <sighs> Laurie is so cute. Um, so the lyrics to that song is... I found them in, in a comment in, in the description. Oh my god. <laughs> All that's left of that bottle of champagne is this. <laughs> oh, I've got another bottle in the fridge if, if I want. Um, this is my $6. <laughs> Tonight we escape. Just you and me. We find our peace somewhere ac across the seas. Enough of the fright, enough of the fuss. I'll be awake if he finds us. Needless to say, I'll stand in your way. I will protect you. I'll take the shot for you. I'll be the shield for you. Needless to say, I'll stand in your way. I'll take the shot for you. Tonight we'll be free. I'll find us a home. Tonight we'll tonight we will be finally on our own. Enough of the hell, enough of the pain. I won't let him touch you. I love you. Needless to say, I'll stand in your way and I will defend you. So who excuse me ladies and fellas that is someone that really loves you someone that will say they will do all those things and mean it okay now of course people can promise you the world but that's not enough Actions speak louder than words, so, I mean, like, yeah, Laurie can write a song and say all that, but, you know, he actually has to, you know, um, he actually has to follow through with his words, otherwise it's just, doesn't mean anything. <sighs> Yep, actions speak louder than words, so... Oh. I always observe people's actions. Um, because people that, you know, the ones that really do love you, they love and protect you and won't... They won't lay a finger on you, they won't say anything horrible to you. Because people that truly love you won't do that to you. Okay? So, <laughs> I just can't stop laughing at you because you're so fucking pathetic. And I know I shouldn't laugh at little kids. But <laughs> your parents don't love you. Your parents are supposed to love and protect you. <laughs> <laughs> but they don't and no one is going to love you ever and no one is going to give a fuck about you I'm talking to Ivy Austin and Riley the only time the only time Your parents did give a fuck about you. Was when they let you be raped. To try ruin my life. And I'm laughing at you because <laughs> because you even protected your own abusers by saying that I did it. I don't know. It's funny because you're ugly. 
It is. Um, whew. so, <laughs> like I said, actions speak louder than words. So, does Ivy's, Austin's, and Riley's parents give a fuck about them based on their actions? No, they don't. Actions speak louder than words, yeah. Rach can say, look, I love my children because I buy them these shoes and because I do that and because I do this. Yeah. But look at what you expose your kids to. So in this case, it's actions speak louder than words, isn't it? The Amazon... Mm-hmm. You fat toad. You even look like a fucking toad. With a stank, loose vagina. I don't know. One of my ex-boyfriends said that he asked me if I'm cheating on him because I'm getting loose. <laughs> and um, so then I got those Benoit balls. And I haven't had any complaints in that department. So why don't you go get yourself some Benoit balls, you fucking loose bitch. <laughs> Well, Nathan told me you were loose. That's why he didn't like having sex with you. And that's why he had sex with me instead. <laughs> Plus, I do my exercises all day, every day. Like, I'm doing them now. Yeah, when I'm sitting around watching TV. I'm just doing my exercises. Ugh. Sick. Now... On Saturday, or Sunday, I don't know what day it was, but it was my brother's birthday on Sunday. So on Saturday we had a little family thing, and we had a cake for my brother and all that. And I made them listen to Lord of the Lost, because they're my new favorite band. And so we're watching the music video for Six Feet Underground. <laughs> um, and so there's a lead singer, Chris. And when he appeared on screen, my brother said, I bet you, I bet you find him attractive. And I said, how did you know? And he said... <laughs> He said, because that's your type. Now, don't ever, and I mean ever, judge a book by its cover. Ever. So I watched interviews, like, you know, with that guy, with those guys from Order Lost, and they are so polite. Yeah, they've got funky haircuts and piercings and tattoos and they're into heavy metal. Peter, I love him so much. He looks, yeah, how can I say? <laughs> Rough as guts, rough as guts. But he was just so sweet, so kind. And he was very, very protective of his women. He loved and worshipped women. He wasn't a womanizer. He just loved women. A lot of respectful women. 
Okay, then you can meet someone that, you know, wears a suit all day, every day. Yeah, stiffs. Um, carries around a briefcase. No tattoos, no piercings. And he can he could be a nasty piece of work behind closed doors. So don't ever judge a book by its cover. I would never date a stiff in my life. Just saying. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. I just saw this come up on my Instagram. Fall in love with taking care of your Fall in love with taking care of yourself, mind, body, and spirit. Yeah. That should be number one priority. Alex's healing tarot. <laughs> this came off my homepage, clearing the air once and for all. What? Why would I want to clear the air with a pedophile? And no. Now, what do you think I would rather, Laurie, from the Rasmus that says, I'll find us a home, I will take the shot for you, I will defend you, or clearing the air with a pedophile? Is it or isn't it a rhetorical question? <gasps> I forgot what a rhetorical question means. I gotta look at my dictionary. A question to which no answer is required. No. So it's not a rhetorical question. So it means you have to answer for it. You have to answer yeah, to it. Um, so I was watching a movie last night called Mona Lisa Smile, which is so good. Um, and I think it was like 1950s. Tastes like shit. It was like 1950s and Kirsten Dunst, she got married <laughs> to a piece of work. And because he was the, he was the, the breadwinner in that marriage. So she was a state, like she was just a, just, just a wife. And the piece of work that she married, that she got married to was a lawyer or something. Oh, <gasps> it's all gone. Um, so he was having an affair. Or something. Now, I 
want the government now to pull their fingers out. Pull your fingers out of your ass. I don't want to watch anymore, but I just played at the beginning of this. Well, I'm just talking. Um, an extreme case of domestic violence where people end up murdered because their partner's a fucking whack job. Now, that's why people end up killed in extreme cases. Because they have to stay with their abuser, especially if they are the one that brings in the money. And that's how that's how their abuser has control over them. It's fucked. So, if there is domestic violence and people need to leave, you need to support them. Look, I've seen, I mean, I've been, keep, been keeping updated on the news with Ukraine and Russia and whatever, and Joe Biden is aiding Ukraine with 500 million bucks, whatever. So surely you can give people money that they need to start their life, to move away from their abusers. That's why every single country needs to have a welfare system. Yeah. Oh, shit. No, I forgot. I totally forgot. I... What the fuck? I must be smashed. Absolutely hammered right now. How the fuck can I forget this? Shut up! That's right. I forgot that the countries I don't have welfare, well, even the countries I do have welfare, like Australia, <gasps> yeah, they want to keep people, like, they do want to put, like, push people into, like, poverty and shit to traffic them. Silly me, how did I forget? Oh man, I can't even shuffle my cards properly. Oh, it's my own dumb fault anyway. Well, it's up to me anyway. It's up to me. Remember Jesse? Hang on. It's Jesse paint a picture, not. What? It's not. Stupid, dumb fuck comics. It's me he's talking about. Oh no! Jesse calls a 5A 
nagging smashing pumpkins something about smashing pumpkins what the fuck Smashing pumpkins. Smashing pumpkins. One of my favorite bands. I love the Smashing Pumpkins. I just heard like smashing pumpkins. Smashing. 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 The Smashing Pumpkins, what of them? <sighs> too many voices, too much noise. I can't, I can't deal with this. I gotta use the loo. Let's listen to the Smashing Pumpkins while I'm going to the loo. I love Cupid Rock. That's my favorite pumpkin song. Pumpkins. Not pumpkins. Pumpkins. No, I love I love Perfect by Smashing Pumpkins.
Oh my god, so I woke up at midday today and when I was waking up, when I was just laying in bed checking my phone, Smashing Pumpkins went live because they're on tour at the moment, so I got to watch them play live because I never had the pleasure to when I was a lot younger. All right. So, <sighs> they had to correct me.
not everyone that comes from like a real fucked up family where there's domestic domestic violence and shit <sighs> turns out bad You could have just told me that. So, what I just saw was I don't know. I just saw someone's feet. And just blood everywhere. Like someone just laying on the ground. And just blood everywhere. The Smashing Pumpkins are on tour with Jane's Addiction. And someone in Jane's Addiction Who the I've never ever listened to Jane's Addiction in my whole life. Jane's Addiction. Domestic violence. What the fuck? Well, I just looked it up and nothing's coming up. Dave Navarro Real Aussies are winning big with the Monopoly game at Knackers. Play now for a one in four chance to win. I definitely use drugs as an escape from the death issue. 
but I also used the death issue to do drugs. The funeral in Westwood was at a church. Then. Dave Navarro, best known as a lead guitarist of Jane's Addiction, opens up about his mother's tragic and brutal death from domestic violence, which he chronicles in the new documentary, Morning Sun. At night, I discovered if I ingest something, I, it's going to make pain better. I picked up a joint and smoked it and realized that it took pain away. I became a full-blown drug addict from that night on. Dave is a scary drug addict. When he goes, he goes for death. There was also the several times where Dave O'Dean died. The truth is that I was just trying to find an escape from all the trauma that I had gone through. And ultimately, all those things did was compound the trauma and make my life much, much worse. Now, Connie Navarro's killer, John Riccardi, was on the run for eight years before he was finally caught by authorities. Take a look. On January 4th, they took him down. Did you do it? No, darling, I didn't do it. Hedonistic, arrogant, vain. Uh, I've now uh, given you adjectives that uh, define uh, John Riccardi. He is a classic stalker. I sat down at the table. And to show how mean-spirited the defendant is, he takes the body, he's going to hide it in the linen cabinet, and he takes the pillow sticks it over her face and snuffs out her last breath of life. Guilty of the crime of murder of a human being, Constance Navarro. Guilty of the crime of murder of a human being, Susan Jory. We the jury in the above entitled action herein fix the penalty to be imposed on the defendant, John Alexander Riccardi, to be death. There it is, bro. My intention to see McCarty is, in my mind, the last step in basically turning this thing inside out. You know, sometimes I don't even know why I'm going to see this in prison. But I know that an answer will be revealed. Riccardi let my mom off the hook, really. Because if he wanted to hurt her, he should have taken me out. That would have made her suffer. Dude, that was They bring him in. He looks at me and goes, what are you doing here? I remember sitting there thinking, why am I not lunging across and trying to strangle this guy? Well, so you walked in there and saw him? Yeah, we went to uh, San Quentin, and uh, and I just went in to visit him, just to look him in the eye and walk out of the prison and leave him there. There was something truly empowering about that. Yeah. You and Robin very much have in common wanting people to recognize. You, you know that she works yeah. in domestic violence, I know, and, and you know both of you talk a lot about, first off, admitting to yourself and saying, this is domestic violence, I'm yeah. in, this is not okay. It's really hard because there's a lot of shame attached to it. Right. You know, a lot of people don't want to admit that they've allowed themselves to be in a volatile situation like this. You know, Robin, you hear it from the women in the shelters all the time. Once they admit it, then that's the first step in making a plan, right? That's exactly right. And sadly, uh, victims are told by their abusers that it's their fault, and they're told that so much that they do become believers of that and it sadly it takes them a long time to believe that it's not their fault that they deserve better your mom was killed when she broke up yeah it's called separation assault there are more serious injuries and murders in the two or three weeks after breaking up from an abuser than any other time in the relationship that is the most dangerous time when you break up and get away from your abuser because they panic. It makes so much sense because, like I said, I wasn't really aware of a whole lot of violent actions in the house. I knew that there was an energy. I knew that there were problems. But, yeah, this was exactly what you're talking about is yeah. at that moment of, of you know, disconnect, 
Yeah. This guy couldn't handle rejection. Oh, wow. Sir, I'll play the end of that with Dr. Phil. Hey, guess what? What Dr. Phil just said about that domestic violence. I yeah. people don't want to admit that they've allowed themselves to be in a volatile situation like this. You know, Robin, you hear it from the women in the shelters all the time. Once they admit it, then that's the first step in making a plan, right? That's exactly right. And sadly, uh, victims are told by their abusers that it's their fault. And they're told that so much that they do become believers of that. And it, sadly, it takes them a long time to believe that it's not their fault, that they deserve better. Your mom was killed when she broke up. Yeah. It's called separation assault. There are more serious injuries and murders in the two or three weeks after breaking up from an abuser than any other time in the relationship. That is the most dangerous time when you break up and get away from your abuser because they panic. It makes so much sense because, like I said, I wasn't really aware of a whole lot of violent actions in the house. I knew that there was an energy. I knew that there were problems. But, yeah, this was exactly what you're talking about is yeah. at that moment of, of you know, disconnect. Yeah. This guy couldn't handle rejection. Oh, my God. I am so sorry to hear that. I'm so sorry. That I've never been – I've never listened to Jane's Addiction either. But I will. I w I'm always looking for new music for new music to get into. So did you hear that, guys? Everyone listening, that there are a lot of killings in the weeks after breakups. So, coppers, to all the coppers that are out there, be prepared. Because now I am encouraging people. Well, I am. I'm not asking. I'm telling people now that are wanting to leave their abusive relationships to come to you. Yeah, you've got to like really, really watch the victims of these people. Because, like, Dr. Doc, Doc, Dr. Phil said that's called um, separation assault and people get killed weeks after they've just separated from their abuser, especially, like, in domestic violence situations. So the moral of um, what Robin, Dr. Phil's wife, was saying is um, she works with women in the in the women's shelter, and the victims that she works with, she says that a lot of them are made to believe that it is their fault, and it takes a long time for them to realize that it isn't their fault. You are not responsible for anybody's actions, okay? At all. They're responsible for their own actions.
I can't believe I just saw that. I only, I only saw feet and blood. I don't have any coping skills either when I see things like this. I need some water. Here, It's Not Your Fault, a short film about domestic abuse. I gotta do my cards. That was so weird. I mean, like, because this is a true story. It happened to me about a year ago. Well, a little under a year ago. So it was when I had that, when I got into a tizzy and I started screaming at everyone and told everyone to go fuck themselves. <laughs> and I was like, I am like a tree. <laughs> I just keep giving and giving and giving and now I'm just a stop. <laughs> well, I'm allowed to be a drama queen. <laughs> it's my right as an individual to be a drama queen. <laughs> it's my right as a human being to be a drama queen. <laughs> but anyway. I was like that. It was. It was around that time. Oh. It was around that time. Yeah, when I told everyone to fuck themselves, and I was about to play. No, I was going to play The Sims, and I... <sighs> yeah, I was playing The Sims, and I like to listen to music videos when I'm playing The Sims. Um, and I was about to put on Typo Negative, and then one of my guides, my one of my ancestors, said play, put on some Metallica. And I only know The Unforgiven 2. And so I was like, alright, well, Katie Elephant just did a cover of The Unforgiven. So I'm going to put that on. 
and uh, I just fell in love with Metallica. So I was like, I was thinking they want to listen to the Smashing Pumpkins. But yeah, it's just weird how everything just because spirits are on a different frequency. So like it sounds like they're talking to me but they're underwater so it's really hard to make out what they're trying to say sometimes. straight like you usually do. I think it really suit curls. And don't you want to look your best for your interview tomorrow? I, I don't think I'm going to go anymore. Oh no, what happened? It's nothing really. <laughs> Silly. Play today, and you're talking to me about clothes. I could pop to the bank. Do you ever use this? Do you ever use your brain? I don't have time for that. I need it today. I'm sorry. Forget it. I'll be late, like I was last time. <laughs> So I'm just going to stick, buy myself a thing, single Pringle, best way to be, because I am sick of being with selfish pricks, to be honest with you. So that's how it's going to be from now on, I think. That's what's best. Do you know what? My Scots been under a lot of stress recently. I could have done much better at making it easier for him. Sorted. Don't worry. Oh, thank goodness. Do you know what? I was so worried you were going to get into trouble and it would have been all my fault. <coughs> Let's not talk about work now. Let's stick a bit of Netflix on and then perhaps afterwards you can uh, you can show me your new clothes and do a little bit of a fashion show. <laughs> it's really nothing fancy. It's all black and white plain clothes. He won't be very impressed. You look beautiful to me in all your clothes. that interview. You've done all that work on your CV. What changed your mind? Live your life within the moment, moment. And don't go wait until the morning, morning. You never know when it is over. All that I know is What's all this? I'm just getting ready for that job interview. 
Job interview? What job interview? This is the first I'm hearing of this. You know, Casey's wedding. That guy Mike is hiring. Oh, that guy. You do realise he's only asked for one thing. Is that really what you spent the emergency cash on? Yeah, I, I thought you were right with it in the end. So you're telling me that I got into trouble at work so you can get tarted up for another guy? No, it's not like that. Do I not give you enough, Hannah? How many holidays do I take you on? I buy you clothes all the time. I take you to fancy restaurants. There's a car parked in the driveway that I bought for you. Look, babe, if it's going to make you this upset, I won't go to the interview. No, please don't go. Please. Go to your fucking interview. Go on. We can bloody well walk. Because I'm taking that dump of a car of yours to the garage for a clean again. working. Oh, it's all right. Don't worry. Just, just give me whatever you've got. Are you sure? Yeah, of course. I haven't even got any cash. Scott doesn't trust me with cash. <laughs> to be honest, I don't trust myself. <laughs> all right, Scott. Can you cancel my card? Looks like I'll have to get this one, Donna. Sorry for the inconvenience. What you like, eh? So, six weeks from now takes us to the 4th. Are you alright with the 4th? No, sorry, we can't do the 4th. Uh, the 5th is a lot better. 5th at 2pm? Lovely. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Donna. See you later. Alright, see you later now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Yeah, that's um, another example of domestic violence. Fuck off! Someone else wants to come through now. No. You know what? really fucking draining. So, um, now, yeah, there are, there are fuckheads out there. <laughs> A lot of fuckheads out there. 
But there's also some amazing people out there who don't say, uh, oh, men are fucked. Oh, women are fucked. No. Some men are fucked. Some women are fucked. Not all of them. There are still amazing people out there. There's plenty more fish in the sea. So if you lose one, so if you have to walk away from one abusive, well, cunt, for lack of a better word, there's plenty more fish in the sea. So I save this now. It says signs he's attracted to you. Oh no, hang on. Signs he's attracted to you. Now, signs he or she is attracted to you. <laughs> he is talking <laughs> to you almost every day. He tells your person he tells you personal details about himself. Treats your friends well. Never uses we'll just say their phone around you. They stand closer to you than he normally would if they're just being friendly. They become overly chatty. They're supportive. Drop a heart in the comments if you feel this post. All right, so um, after I dumped Joel and I was just over it, I was just over ugh, it. And I watched a dating expert on Dr. Phil. And so this dating expert said, Interested people show signs of interest and unhealthy people play games. So, you know how there's that saying, keep them keen? No, treat them mean, keep them keen. I don't know how the fuck that's supposed to work because if someone... <sighs> I break up with people over the smallest things. Like, last year, I was seeing one guy that was a slob, so I stopped seeing him. Then I saw another one that had bad breath. Didn't know how to separate recycling from trash. And then he farted in front of me. So I <laughs> stopped seeing stopped seeing him after that. I'm very impatient. Um So I thought this was really important to save and talk about. Read this when you start dating again. Worry less about if they like you and more about if you even like them. Rejection is not as personal as it feels. Liking someone or being liked is more about compatibility than inherent worth. Three, stop choosing what isn't choosing you. If it's not mutual, why pursue it? Ask yourself, well, number four, ask yourself, would you be friends with this person if you were physically attracted to them? Be honest. Five, stop being shocked by, repeatedly, by repeated behavior. Notice patterns and believe them. Six, you don't need to be perfect to be loved. Perfection isn't relatable. You can't connect to it. How true. Seven, your love life is one area of your life. Don't forget to nurture the rest. Significant others aside, when you visualize coming home to a life you love, what does that look like? Be specific. Oh, and this is a little blurb. I think. 
All right. Have you ever met a guy? Have you ever get? Has a guy ever given you mixed signals? One minute he's crazy about you, and the next minute you have no clue if he ever wants to see you again. There's one big reason why men do this. Tap in the link in my bio to watch the most important video you have ever seen. Well, Well, if they give you mixed signals, <laughs> my advice, cut and run. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh no, that's just my saved. That's not my perf page. It was just like all these pictures of um, Peter Steele. Peter. This is my favorite one. Boy, autumn is the most favorite season. Just about everyone, but the trees are flame and the water still. And by far, my favorite season. This is probably the perfect location, as you see here, for me to build my dream house. Like a Frank Lloyd Wright type of uh, falling water house in a location like this, but a lot more glass. And every morning when I wake up, I have the woods to one side and water to the other, the sky above. And it would always seem like I was outside, and I could enjoy nature in all the seasons. So perhaps, take a few trees down here, the very few trees, build a nice little house for my woman, and worship all the rest of my life. I think it's any wonder why autumn is the most favorite season. Just about everyone, the trees are flame and the water still. It is by far my favorite season. This is probably the perfect location, as you see here, for me to build my dream house, like a Frank Lloyd Wright type of uh, falling water house in a location like this, but a lot more glass. And every morning when I wake up, I have the woods to one side and water to the other, the sky above. And it would always seem like I was outside, and I could enjoy nature in all the seasons. So perhaps take a few trees down here, the very few trees, build a nice little house for my woman, and worship her the rest of my life. Uh, yes. But of course, actions um, do speak louder than words. Um, what the fuck does that even mean? Don't. Yeah. Hi, I'm Madeline. Welcome to Contemporary Tarot. In this session, we're going to be looking at the moon. The moon represents facing your deepest fears. It can represent feeling pulled by something deep and profound and something that um, defies language and definition. It represents your dreams. It represents your nightmares, fantasies, illusion, things that are unseen, a sense or feeling of being pulled by tides or unknown motivations, looking at things in a different light, being able to sense dishonesty and guile, acting instinctively, being in the dark about something, tapping into your subconscious to understand yourself and your life. It can represent repeating patterns or returning to a previous cycle in your life, being bewildered, scared, confused, uncertain, or frightened, but still moving with courage or a sense of calm after having given over to the cosmic pull of the universal themes in your life. Deep currents running beneath typical behavior. Stillness, a willingness and ability to face and understand complex emotions, relationships, and behaviors rooted in past experience. And spending time exploring your dreams, fantasies, nightmares, and deeply motivated behavior um, 
that's really, that, that's profound, that um, again, almost defies words. Your best course of action with the moon is first off, face your fears, look at them, uh, embrace to that you might not be able to completely understand the situation right now. It might be time just to sit and kind of be in the dark over something. Explore the uh, deep motivations in your life. Look at the patterns and cycles that return again and again and again. Be honest with yourself and others. Be still. Know that powerful forces are at work. This is not a superficial time. Pay attention to your dreams, nightmares, fears, and fantasies. And explore the common threads that link um, your universal themes in your life. And if you can't uh, make logical sense of things, don't. Just sit with things. Um, let things reveal themselves. You're going, again, through a very auspicious time, um, but it really is quite deep and, and rather private. All right, the uh, moon reversed. I see. So that's what <laughs> that's what they wanted me to know, and I was so rude. <gasps> when I tell them to f off, Yeah, I guess I'm just a little bit worried and stressed um, because last night Philosophical LLC put on her community board last night. Um, she said, Traviker alert, be aware of your surroundings. They're at it again. So I'm just like, well, no one can touch me. Like I'm just watching telly and sirens are just going off and I just ignore it. Cause it's like, well, I'm under attack for a reason, but you're being watched. Hence the sirens going off. They're letting you know. Like the police letting you know that they're coming. Like they're around. Protecting me. So I don't know why you even fucking bother coming after me at all. Because you don't scare me. I'm just um worried and stressed about other people that are at risk of being lured, in, lured into trafficking by these fuckheads if they're not stopped and caught. Ha! And on top of that, on top of that, it's just constant, me, 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 constant, constant talking at me. Oh. <laughs> so... <laughs> it's uh, I'm just a little bit overwhelmed at the moment. Oh. I mean, <sighs> too much, man. Sometimes it's just too much. <sighs> like, I actually don't get any time to myself. Because I'm always, like, being talked at. <sighs> and a lot of the times I see things that I don't want to see. But they show me anyway. So now you know 
why I'm left alone. <laughs> why I need to be left alone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just don't think I need to stress anymore about how important um, it is to speak up if you feel you are a victim of domestic violence. Um, we've seen, fuck, I mean, it's, tr it's horrible when it happens, but of course it can be prevented. And there needs to be more services available to domestic violence victims, especially especially the ones that feel like they have to stay with the with the abuser so they don't end up where Dr. Phil's wife works in shelters and refu ref, um, refuges, women's refuge, you know, shelters. Um, but. I've already explained why it's important for every country to be on welfare. Shall do one more reading. The guy in the apartment next to me is snoring really loud. So that means he's tired. And it's quarter to midnight and then I'm going to eat my another cannoli and watch Gossip Girl and um, to the authorities yeah when I went when I, I need to take off this fucking bra <laughs> authorities like um today because I was so hungry I couldn't think properly so I forgot to let you know that I was going across the road to get Italian <laughs> um so just in case I forget to tell you tomorrow or whenever I need to start working out a lot I need to start exercising a lot and I want to get my nails done because look, uh, damn. Um, so yeah, please um, just watch my movements. I'll be going to the gym a lot and I'm going to be spending a lot of time. Oh, this came out in the reverse for me. Coming out of like anxiety and shit. Um, Freedom. Freedom. But yeah, just watch the area. Please. Uh huh. Now, you know how I said that I hated cops? Well, I hate the. I hate the shitty dirty ones but um when I was walking back from the shops yesterday uh, not yesterday the other day on Saturday I think there was like a police woman that came out of, the, out of the police station and I think she was looking for me and she just came out and gave me like this really 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 big smile so it was lovely
Yeah, they need me. They want me to be more balanced. Oh, I think it's like, you know, with, um, especially with my, um, with my diet, but fuck. I love food though. <laughs> Ooh, la la. Okay. Yeah. I um I don't know like I know what global warming is, but I live in the world. I'm not of this world if that makes any sense. So, just give me a day or two to do my research on global warming and um, I don't know how to fix it um, but I can try come up with some ideas I can try I I won't have the answers though um, but yeah so Leonardo keep doing your amazing work spreading awareness and and all that And to all the amazing scientists, keep some, just keep on, like, you know, doing your research and whatever. You'll find a solution. Where there's a will, there's a way. All right, so until next time, I love you.